right here. Mm. Okay. Oops. There you go. Cool. Hello, everyone. My name is Alec Hewitt, um, and I am presenting uh, an analysis of RR Lyra over densities as well as their metallicity. So let's jump right into it. Um, briefly after the universe began to form, roughly 380,000 years after the Big Bang, hydrogen and helium atoms begin to form. And roughly 1.6 million years later, these huge hydrogen and helium clouds be began to cool and condense into stars. And these stars eventually formed galaxies. This immense force of gravity needs to be counteracted by the effects of nuclear fusion, where two nuclei fuse to together to create a single nucleus while re releasing energy. Um, an example of this is illustrated in uh, this top image where we have four hydrogen atoms undergoing a series of nuclear reactions that eventually result in the production of helium. And when two nuclei fuse together, this releases an enormous amount of energy in the form of particles of light, which we call photons. And in the middle of the star, this produces gamma rays. And these photons, while they're massless, they still carry momentum. And this momentum exerts an outward pressure on the star, and it counteracts the force of gravity and prevents the star from collapsing on itself. And so let's make sure we understand this slightly more intuitively. Visualize a photon being formed at the center of a star. Um, near the center of a star, the, the pressure is going to be so great that uh, the atoms can no longer bound the electrons. And so this photon is going to undergo millions of collisions as it slowly loses energy and goes to the surface of the star. And near the surface of the star, the pressure is low enough that the atoms contain electrons. And these electrons absorb that photon. They become unstable, and then they emit this photon out into the universe. The cool thing about this is, is that this, this photon uniquely corresponds to the atom that emitted it. And by analyzing the color or the wavelength of that photon, we can determine what element it came from. And so this occurs all of the time within a star. And to put this into perspective, our sun converts roughly 4 million tons of mass into energy every second. Um, and this is also why we can see stars. And the fact that each photon uniquely corresponds to a specific element means that we can receive the light from a star and diffract it into its specific wavelength like this bottom image shows. And we can analyze the colors and the intensities of each color to determine the exact composition of that star. Um, but however, when the star fuses atoms to create iron, this no longer releases energy, but instead it absorbs energy. And so when stars begin to fuse to create iron, they will eventually undergo a supernova explosion, throwing out most of their mass into the universe and either collapsing into a neutron star or a black hole. And this, this huge mass cloud will end up cooling and condensing, and it'll form new stars. And this newer generation of stars contains more metals than the previous generation, since it is formed from the remnants of the previous star. So I gave you a pretty intuitive idea as to how we determine the composition of a star based off of its spectra or its light. Um, but the stars that we're concerned with are called RR Lyra variables, which are variable stars, meaning that they pulsate over time. And astronomers call these brightness versus time graphs light curves. And from these light curves, they can derive the spectra of the star and thus determine the composition of a star from its, um, from its light curve using mathematical formulas. So I'm going to address metallicity because I'm going to bring it up a lot. Um, you can visualize this as the ratio of iron atoms within a star to the number of hydrogen or helium atoms within a star. And so in this presentation, I'm mainly concerned with uh, comparing the metallicity of a star to our sun. Um, and this is the formula that allows us to do this, so let's make sure we understand it. The first term, the first logarithm term, is the metallicity of the star. Second term is the metallicity of our sun. And um, this is in logarithm form, and it compares in that way. So if it's greater than 0, that means it has a greater metallicity than our sun. If it's less than 0, it has a less metallicity than our sun. Equal to 0, it has the same metallicity as our sun. And we're concerned with, um, with comparing the metallicity of a star to the metallicity of our sun because our galaxy formed at roughly the same time. So using that logic, regions within our galaxy should contain roughly the same metallicities. 
And if they don't, this signifies that those regions in our galaxies originated from an entire other galaxy entirely, and it just happened to get eaten by our own galaxy. And so um, in a paper published by Tori Alba et al., they, they claim that metallicity can change in another way. They claim that as you increase the vertical distance from the galactic plane, which is the elliptical disk, um, that the metallicity would decrease. And they also claim that as you increase the radial distance from the galactic center, that the metallicity would also decrease. So me, with the help of Jonathan Barnes, um, I wanted to test these claims, and I used their data to make plots of my own. Um, and this, these are my plots. The first one compares the metallicity with the radial distance from the galactic center. Um, and this horizontal axis represents the radial distance, and the vertical axis represents the metallicity. And as we increase this radial distance from the galactic center, we can see that the metallicity of the star decreases. Likewise, the second bottom graph, um, this compares the metallicity with the height from the galactic plane. And so this horizontal axis is the height from the galactic plane, vertical axis is the metallicity. As we increase the height from the galactic plane, we can see that the metallicity decreases. So our plots agree with their claims using their data, of course. So using coordinates of right ascension and declination, they locate areas in our sky or points in our sky from which we receive light. And they plot this on this first graph where the horizontal axis is right ascension, the vertical axis is declination. and um, you can see that part of this graph is completely empty. And this is because this region lies within the galactic plane. And from the perspective of us, the light coming from those areas is so overly dense that we can't differentiate the, the different light forms coming towards it. So they don't include this in their analysis. And they also locate areas, colored areas, that they consider to be overly dense with stars. And they attribute these over densities as originating from different galaxies. So I wanted to take it a step further, me and Jonathan Barnes, and uh, we, they, we were given the right ascension and declination of each of these regions. And so they also give a, us a um, thickness of the coordinate. So this gives us an area. And they also give us a distance away from us as well as a depth. So they give us an exact location of the volume um, that they consider to be overly dense with stars, and we can analyze that for its metallicity to see if it significantly differs with our sun. So um, using that formula that, that I showed you, we compared the metallicity of the star with our sun, and we can see that um, this is in logarithm form, so it's kind of hard to understand. So the bottom row is percent more. So if it's negative, that means it has that much percent less metal than our star. If it's positive, that means it has that much percent more than our star. And we can see that it doesn't significantly differ with the metal content of our sun. Um, it, it ranges from roughly 11% less than our sun to 22% more than our sun, with one of them being an outlier at roughly 48% more metal content than our sun. So this, this outlier, 48% more metallicity than our sun, it might seem significant, but let's, let's dig deeper into this. We can locate where it should lie, what its metal content should be based off, off of our plots. So we can see that it has a, um, a, a distance away from us that's 4.5 kiloparsecs, as well as a metallicity that's negative 1.2. So if we go back to our previous graph, if, it, it's kind of hard to see, but if, if you look at the distance, the radial distance of um, roughly 0.5 and a iron content of negative 1.2, we see that regardless of the graph that you look at, it lies exactly where it should be. So even though it looks significant, it's not as significant as it seems. So there's two conclusions that we could draw from this. Either that they shouldn't have claimed that these over densities originated from other galaxies, um, or the more believable reason is that these over densities did originate from other galaxies, and my data supports that um, the metallicity of other galaxies is relatively the same as the metal content within our galaxy, which makes sense because if you think about it, our universe was formed at the same time, meaning that 
each of the galaxies was formed roughly at the same time as well. So it would make sense that their metal content should be roughly the same throughout. And that is it. Thank you. Oh, any questions? Any questions? How many data points did I have? Um, they gave us roughly 10,000 stars, 9,000 stars actually, of our, our Lyra variable stars, and we were able to go off of that data. They also gave us the regions of the over densities as well. So uh, the graph of how the metal content is given is given as a way to uh, spread the load coefficient. Is that surprising, or is the outgoing electron in the metal content bad, or is that not surprising? Uh, the spread, the standard deviation. Yeah, that wasn't really expected, and I wasn't sure what to think about that, and it, it is true. The standard deviation does decrease as you get away from the galactic center, which, but as far as I'm aware of, I'm not 100% sure. Any other questions? <laughs>